Thank you for joining us. My name is Victor and I'm a librarian with the Youth Services Department here at Sacramento Public Library. We are excited to welcome you to the STEAM, uh, to the STEAM Youth Leadership Program Series. This program is funded by the California State Library's Stronger Together Initiative. Go ahead, Jaya. Today, we have the opportunity to engage in conversation with Michael Bell. He has a Bachelor in Science in Mechanical Engineering Technology and a Master of Science on Mechanical Engineering, both from California State University, Sacramento. He is the CEO and founder of STEAM Bio a systems integrated company, which meets the needs of industrial businesses such as prototype manufacturing, smart manufacturing, and workforce development. Michael is the current chair of the Sacramento Valley Society of Manufacturing Engineers, and in the fourth quarter of 2020 was given the Champion for Industry Award by Thomas, an industry source platform with over 120 years of experience in the field for being a leader that embraces innovation, inspires colleagues, and dedicated to find trailblazing solutions to drive businesses forward. Michael has been a drum instructor for Sierra College and the Deputy Sector Navigator on Advanced Manufacturing of the North Region on the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. He was also Director of the Workforce Development on California Mobility Center. Michael has managed all these responsibilities while being an adjunct professor at California State University, Sacramento, teaching design and manufacturing courses for over 12 years. Welcome, Michael Bell. Thanks for the intro. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Michael, I would like to introduce you to uh, to our cohort members, Grace, Jeha, and Rosie, who are ready to start con conversation with you about your personal journey as a Black Indigenous and Latinx STEM professional. Have fun. Hi, Michael. I just want to thank you again for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Um, how are you feeling today? Feeling nervous, excited? Oh, it's the end of the day. I'm on the East Coast, so I just got done eating dinner, so I'm pretty relaxed right now. Wonderful. I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I see that you majored in mechanical engineering at Sacramento State. You received your bachelor's and your master's degree in that major. Were you always planning on studying that major or what drew you into that area of study? So I've always grown up uh, enjoying playing with Legos uh, and was really good at math. I did not have any idea of a combination of those skill sets, what that would lead to. Um, I actually didn't even consider applying for university until after I graduated high school back in 2005 and didn't start university until 2006, a semester after I started doing some work. Um, and it was only when I looked at the catalog of programs, when I looked at, all right, engineering, that looks like it's something I'd be interested in. Mechanical engineering, let's sign me up. Um, and I fell in love with it right away after I got exposed to a, a student club called Formula SAE. Uh, we made uh, open wheel style race cars from scratch and it was all student led project. So yeah, really no exposure. My grandpa was an electro engineer, but didn't realize that, didn't know that until 15 years later after I graduated, that, that was the case. Um, but yeah, I've always loved creating something uh, from scratch that I, I thought about in my head and then watching it become reality. It's always been fascinating to me. You have lots of experience from product engineering to advanced manufacturing to becoming the CEO of your own business, Synbio. Can you tell me a bit about how your past experiences led you up to creating your own business and what was that journey like? Yeah, growing up, my mama was always, she's uh, born and raised in Mexico, so I'm half Latin myself, uh, but she always had a uh, focus on community uh, and her family around her. Um, and so that's kind of driven me to maintain a, a culture and a principle uh, of creating a business that is first and last priority is the people that help develop the business itself. So Symbio actually stands for uh, symbiosis and synergy, combination of those two uh, with the idea of, of any solution that we create um, enhances everybody's life, livelihood and and everybody is seen as equal partners in, in the journey of development. So that's been uh, it's been the transition pivoting a few years um, since 2019. But I think now we have a pretty good team together and we've got a clear focus moving forward. You said that you focus a lot on community and like helping other businesses. Are there is there any was there a time where like you uh, did help out uh, another a uh, business or a community member that stuck out to you and like kind of inspired you to keep going? Well, women's empowerment in particular, they're a nonprofit, um, women's empowerment, St. John's and Wake in the Village. They all serve homeless uh, or people transitioning from homelessness or actively experiencing homelessness in combination of shelters uh, that they provide and also <clears throat> supportive services. I collaborated with them as I was representing 
the California Mobility Center as the director for workforce development and work with them to create uh, pipelines uh, of talent into manufacturing by creating tailored programs that are fit into what they've already created, but, but um, reducing the barrier of entry or at least reducing the barrier of exposure. Uh, and once uh, these uh, ladies and these young people were exposed to these these skill sets and processes, I, and that's why I was in education. I I enjoyed the the journey of enlightenment um, and helping them like guide through that process. So it's always been fascinating helping mold the minds of people into manufacturing, knowing from my own personal experience that I had a little taste of it in high school uh, manufacturing in, in woodshop in Puerto Rico, um, but then not really um, understanding how those skill sets can lead into a career. So that's why I'm, I'm happy to uh, help bridge that gap of knowledge and understanding while also experiencing the that uh, journey of enlightenment and just being part of that, that process. So women's empowerment, um, again, they, they are uh, have cohorts for every quarter and they have a new batch of women that go through the process and they have a lifelong uh, training opportunities for anybody that wants to come back for for more support. So that, that particular organization has been uh, inspiring and, and allows me to, to realize that there's value in partnerships and collaboration. I and mean, if we work together, uh, we can definitely solve the most complex and uh, seemingly impossible uh, challenges. Thank you for that. I think your work is very crucial and it's very inspiring. Um, can you give a brief summary of what your company, Synbio, is to those that are unfamiliar? Yeah, it's taken me a while to kind of uh, flush out my my uh, pitch to explain what what I, what I do. I actually started Symbio as an um, industrial co-working space. Anybody heard of Hacker Lab by any chance? They were one of the large. They were the largest co-working space in the region. They uh, went out of business, unfortunately. Um, but my idea was to have a space where their uh, fellow colleagues of mine, uh, engineers and designers, makers, had a space to go work. Uh, based on their business specifically, not just uh, being a hobbyist or, or learning. But that quickly changed with COVID and even before that, realizing not enough people know how to use the equipment that I have. I have industrial equipment uh, and automation equipment that is pretty standard in industry, but um, not standard in the general public. Uh, so it definitely takes a little le uh, level of uh, skill sets and training to, to master. Uh, not impossible, just take some time. But then I've realized I got to pivot towards a more workforce development, given that's that's where a lot of the funding and, and opportunities were at. Uh, but recently, the last really like three, four months, I realized my I'm going back to the basic, going back to my passion, which is to make machines and make equipment and create a product from uh, from ideation to to prototyping. And so we are now a manufacturing engineering consulting company, um, but we also double just by, again, my my uh, principles and values as a apprenticeship agency. We help bridge the gap of the community in the industry uh, while uh, by providing training programs, customized training programs. And at the same time, we leverage this new talent coming into the pipeline to work on projects and work for other companies in the region. When opening your new business or like just your own business in general, I know there can be definitely a lot of like ups and downs and hardships. Um, did you have to overcome any like specific hardships that you would like to talk about? And how did you, yeah, overcome those? Every day is a hardship. Um, <laughs> and we're, I'm in the startup mindset. Um, I had to pivot three times, uh, like I say. So uh, I'm, I'm still in the midst of figuring out how to get out of the hole that we're in without you know, laying off my staff and and shutting the business down. But as far as uh, getting past it, this is where the power of networking is very, very valuable. Um, most engineers aren't very sociable, uh, but I've, I've always been comfortable with, you know, put myself out there, trying stuff I don't know and meeting people I don't know, just to gauge uh, where there's similarities. But I've, I've been able to, over the past 15 years, amass a really deep uh, network of manufacturing partners in the Sacramento Valley region. I've toured over a hundred companies. Um, I've got contacts all throughout the, the executive management level and even production folks. And so I just uh, started tapping into that network to get the feelers out to let them know uh, I'm back in business, going back to basics and, and creating 
uh, custom solutions for for their challenges, and that's definitely bore fruit even just the past couple months. But not out of the hole. So got a uh, there's an adage for uh, business uh, evolve or die. So I'm in I'm in the evolution stage right now. Thank you for that answer. You mentioned the importance of ne- networking. How would you um, advise future engineers that are starting up? Like, how would you give them advice on how to start networking? Because you seem to have a pretty big uh, pool of networks. So how would you get started on that? There's no wrong answer other than not showing up. Um, so if you see an opportunity. Um, uh, that's in line, any even closely aligned to your interest, um, definitely take advantage of going to meetups, mixers, um, uh, even just general uh, presentations and webinars. Chances are there are other like-minded individuals uh, that are part of those events and part of those uh, presentations, and you can start taking inventory of who's who in the zoo, like who's working where, what are their positions, and and reaching out, especially for you young folks, uh, there's a lot of interest and um, demand from existing companies to engage the the youth, in particular young adults and youth. And so just saying hi and saying your name and you want to know more about what they do, they're never going to say no. Um, So they're going to open up doors and, and lay down the groundwork for you. That's much different than when I was growing up and going to university and even graduating high school. Uh, the, the emphasis in engaging youth wasn't there. Um, so I, I definitely had to grind a little bit more. But yeah, it just really comes down to just y'all getting out of your own way and getting out of your own head and, and being comfortable with with doing things you haven't done before and, and trusting in your ability to learn and, and grow. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, you can't knock it until you try and you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to grow. On the flip side of that, of hardships, creating your own business must be extremely rewarding as well. Uh, were there any moments of accomplish, accomplishment that you were the most proud of? Uh, yeah. I mean, able to secure a team that I have now uh, that are thousand percent committed and interested in retiring at my company. We just started, right? So that that's pretty rare um, because I, I reinforce and um and I state verbally, I'm very open and sometimes I share too much, but uh, I definitely make it very clear that uh, I'm all about making sure that the business itself serves the employee base, the community of employees. Uh, right now, I've got eight people, four are part-time, four are full-time, but six of them are, are apprentices. They're, all, they're learning and want to be manufacturing engineers and and decided to go, go down this journey with me. So I'm definitely... Uh, uh, appreciative of that commitment and, and don't take it lightly. And they know that. Yeah, I think that's super important. A lot of companies are uh, very focused on customers and consumers, but not a lot of times they're focused on their own workers. So I think that's very important. Very cool of you. Um, they're focused on profits over over people. Uh, the kind of the shift, I definitely I have to be profit focused, but in the context of um, making sure that uh, the, the value that the company brings brings value to the employees first before it brings value to me uh, as the owner. So that's definitely a shift and, and not norm uh, for sure. But uh, I just I just chose from the very beginning. That's why, again, the, the whole business name itself is, is embedded in it. Um, if it doesn't work for everybody as a symbiotic relationship, um, then there's no point in doing it. Super cool. Thank you. I have one more question before handing off to Grace. Uh, your company does a, dum- a number of different uh, operations. It does prototyping, manufacturing, machining, and a lot more. Uh, how do you tie in sustainability when operating in so many ways? A couple things. One is um, there's a term called zero waste or, or lean manufacturing. That's the idea of reducing waste to the point where eliminating waste is the goal, but uh, reducing uh or increasing efficiency of equipment being used to make sure that there's not more power needed to run uh, to operate equipment than needed. And, and thinking about the materials being used to create products, making sure that they can be made out of, uh, of less, less materials as possible or sustainable materials like recycled materials, plastics, woods, and metals in particular. And then on the flip side, um, the, the projects and the companies I work with, uh, I've got to focus on ensuring that we have a baseline of talent that can be used to support clean tech development. Um, any kind of hardware prototyping, uh, the, the it's called the, the great pit of death uh, 
anybody can come up with ideas and have money thrown at them on, on doing the dog and pony. But when it comes to actually creating physical hardware or product, um, it's much different than software. You got a lot of less uh, capital, less uh, investment into equipment and facilities for developing software. But when it comes to hardware, you can't get around with having a shop, operations, inventory, logistics. And so a lot of people that don't have that experience um, need my support or need companies like me to help guide them along the process to ensure that they don't that they design a product that can be a prototype in as little time as possible by helping reduce the waste. And of course, my focus is still on clean tech. Um, ultimately, that's my end goal. I'm all about uh, geothermal energy and, and electrolyzers. Um, so that's the ultimate goal is to, to get to that point. But I understand I've got to tackle the labor shortage issue in manufacturing before I take that plunge. Um, again, I could do it myself, but I'm all about uh, making sure that the ecosystem itself is healthy before I, I uh, go full bore there. Thank you, Grace, whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Grace, and I'll be asking you the questions now. Um, my first question is, when you first created Symbio, what made you want to focus your clientele on individuals and small businesses? Can you share any specific um, experiences or insights that guided, guided this focus? Yeah, big businesses, they have the resources, funding, personnel, to solve their own problems typically. Uh, they get stuck with bureaucracy and red tape, but the small businesses, uh, medium medium and small uh, manufacturing in particular, even if they wanted and they have the commitment from their the executive team, um, they just don't have the resources, the bandwidth to solve uh, the most critical problems that they have. And so those are the, the individuals that I work with for that reason. And an example, specifically a company called Insight Manufacturing Services, they're in Rancho Cordova. They uh, small business, got a couple locations, one in Murphy's, one in um, Rancho Cordova, but they could not find assemblers, people to fill assembler roles uh, back in the, the height of COVID. And they had orders coming up and they were struggling with figuring out, okay, how, what do they do? They, they have work here, but they don't have bodies in the seats. And so we worked together when I was with the, the California Mobility Center to identify people that were eager and hungry to work at that company. And they, they changed their culture by allowing somebody, a lady, she was in her 60s and just coming from women's empowerment, an alumni. She had mobility issues and all that, but you now she's still working there a year and a half later uh, because the, cult, the company shift their culture and reduced the barrier of entry. And that's how we collaborated to, to fill those seats and to train them, those people up to be able to work on assembly work, which is a good foundation for, for manufacturing. Uh, but we helped fill five or six positions in that company. And that, that essentially saved the company from um, canceling their order. Uh, and then now they're, they're still growing and, and thriving. So that's, a, that's a one example of, of many uh, examples that I've got for, for the direct support and working directly with uh, business owners and presidents and executives, um, as opposed to a large company. You know, their CEO may not even be here in the region. But they may not live in Sacramento. So then definitely that's where I, I personally focus on local engagement and being able to talk with the owners directly and, and convince them to um, change their, their tactics and their culture. And slowly, you know, eventually a few years from now, 10 years from now, we'll have a nice cohesive culture, is my vision anyways, um, where uh, traditional for-profit companies change how they operate and how they recruit uh, with the emphasis on an inclusion and opening their doors to the public and providing those those roadmaps and those gateways to success. That's amazing. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's a really cool concept. And my next question is, as consumers, we are drawn to more sustainable business approaches. When it comes to our products, um, how have you balanced Symbio's operational efficiency with sustainable practices. What challenges and achievements have you encountered in this endeavor? Well, it comes down to products that I, I buy or actually, well, the key focus for me is to buy used equipment. So we never buy uh, anything new as far as large capital equipment. And, and our focus, our bread and butter is actually about uh, taking old equipment and reviving it. Equipment from the 80s and 90s that have old electronics and old software. Mechanically, they're still good. So 
teaching people how to hack old systems and how to uh, be able to operate uh, equipment that doesn't have the latest bells and whistles and fancy software and electronics, but still do the job that's needed. That's definitely how I can help. Uh, so that's that's the balance I look at is how I can use old equipment, repurpose it, uh, revive it, and then uh, extend that life or even add value uh, in places that people didn't think were, were valuable. That's what, that's the most uh, thing, critical thing I do now, besides what I said earlier about focusing on working on projects that that I see could add value to the, the community or the society as far as their products they make. I think it's personally awesome that you reuse old machinery rather than buying new ones because I feel like that would be maybe cheaper. And also it's not like contributing to like buying stuff, you know, and then like throwing it out. I feel, I find it really cool that you fix it up. And my... Next question is, could you describe a typical day or a week in your role at Symbio? How do you pri or sorry, how do you prioritize and manage your task? And what aspects of your work do you find most rewarding? So uh, manage we use a software called Rike, W-R-I-K-E. It's a task management platform that I've uh, forced my team to start using uh, a few months ago because we need to automate our communication and making sure we work as efficiently as possible. And so this tool allows us to track what tasks we got to work on each day. Um, we can communicate with each other by essentially asking each one of us to do, do a task, but do it through the software and it automatically populates in our queue. So I, I didn't get the, the, there's a couple of questions you asked there. Yeah. Um, my questions were, could you describe a typical day or week in your role at Symbio? And then how do you prioritize and manage your task? And what aspects of your work do you find most rewarding? Sorry, I know it's a lot of questions and just <laughs> one question, but um, no problem, you, no problem. you don't have to answer all of them, just, you know, for the most part, summarize. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Day, uh, I mean, it's this pretty relaxed environment. That's what I like. Uh, so we've, we've got a combination of training programs that we created ourselves. Uh, Again, we line with these nonprofits or word of mouth, uh, mostly people that are suffering from drug abuse uh, disorder, uh, homelessness, um, ex-offenders, uh, the world marginalized individuals. Uh, that's who our focus is for these training programs. So some of our half our time or majority of our time right now is spent on developing new curriculum, coming up with new projects, activities, uh, little trinkets, little gadgets that we can use in training. We actually use a 3D printer and we have people assemble a 3D printer from scratch and then create an electric car uh, from scratch and then teach them if they come back for the next phase on how to design um, products like that and work on heavy machinery as well. And uh, that definitely helps provide this pathway towards an exposure towards uh, potential careers. So that's the typical day. And then on, on the outside of training, we work on custom manufacturing projects, making parts for different companies or helping fix uh, other types of equipment and parts for them. And then aspects of my job, again, I, every day, <clears throat> every day I go and ask my staff how they're doing, how they're feeling, what, what can I do to, to make their lives better? What, what can we do as a company to, to be more efficient? And uh, so that, that constant feedback loop and that uh, the feedback that I get from the staff is, is very rewarding uh, knowing that I'm on the right path and, and, uh, they're just not, you know, telling me what I want to hear, but tell me what what's really in their heart. So it's definitely rewarding. The best part. I mean, of course, anytime I'm in the shop, I'm happy. So uh, working uh, working on machines and and creating cool stuff uh, every day. That's fun. I do that for free already. So uh, doing it as a business, it's it's a bonus. Sorry, <laughs> um, that sounds amazing. Also, I like how you how you sorry how you um prioritize honesty among your staff because honesty is really important and I value that too because it's a very important value and as a business owner I would like to know honesty um in what I should be doing to to improve my business and I find that really cool that you value that in your staff and then yeah. my next question is, do you have any distinct plans in the future regarding sustainability practices such as car, uh, carbon neutral or zero waste? Yeah, so zero waste, that's, we're starting that journey now. now. 
I'm having to educate my staff on just basics on recycling. You know, they they've never really done that, which is baffling. Uh, but my wife has drilled that to my head. I mean, down to like uh, the little tags on clothes. She's like, is that recyclable? <laughs> so I've gotten uh, used to uh, looking at uh, products and and recognizing the materials they're made out of. And right now, in the process of teaching my staff on on how to do that internally. But ultimately, you know, my vision is uh, to create a, a a product or a system that really taps into sustainable energy sources using Earth's energy, essentially geothermal energy and the ocean uh, to create uh, geothermal based electrolyzers, like I said earlier. So that's that's the vision. Um, it's going to take me seven to 10 years to develop that product, I think, uh, to the point where it's, it's viable. But we need that. Uh, soon as we can get that as a as a globe, really. Um, so that that's what I'm focused on at the moment, and just going on the journey. I before this before today, I've never really heard of GMO uh, geothermal energy, but it's intriguing to know that you could tap into other natural resources for energy, because the main ones I know are like um, coal or or um, what's the other one? It's a uh, solar it's- wind. Solar wind, yeah, and so I. But it'd be cool to see a product that like harvests energy through geo geothermal, and so I think that's a really cool project that you're taking. I welcome you to to look at undersea hydro vents. Um, Okay. The ocean floors littered with lava vents that are that are spattered throughout the the ocean floor. The fact that we've only explored a, a fraction of the ocean floor leads to the lack of understanding that we've got perpetual energy source literally under our feet um, that we really haven't tapped into as a, as a society. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see what more we can explore of the ocean and a possible energy source because okay. I feel like that'd be cool to like make it more, you know, um, focus on that as our energy source because it's mm-hmm. such an abundant source because it's just like you know engine's core is not going to stall anytime soon that's for sure yeah that's what i mean thank you or the earth's core excuse me okay so my last question before i hand it off to uh, jaya is reflecting on your engineering core uh career what personal attributes or habits do you believe have been instrumental in your success i advocate this as often as i can to, to young folks in particular uh, student clubs, the value of, of participating and, and taking advantage of a student club. Um, everything I've learned for manufacturing engineering really wasn't through the classroom. Um, that gave me the baseline and fundamentals. And yeah, I checked the box to say I can I can do some equations and, and answer some questions in a textbook. But to apply that uh, in real time, that's the challenge. And that's really where um, rural engineers are, are separated out from from other engineers. It's being able to take that knowledge and apply that in a in a scenario in a situation where no other solution exists. And so that's uh, that was the most invaluable uh, experience I've got. And I was part of the club all four years in my undergrad, two years treasurer, two years president, um, and being in that leadership role uh, just organically exposed me to how. Funding is is managed in the school system and how there's pockets of money scattered throughout the whole system that many people just don't even know about or or it's too complicated to tap into. So that's also gave me some some experience in knowing how to navigate uh, public dollars and how to be a steward of of those dollars uh, in in the right way. That's interesting because I never thought that being involved engaging in student clubs you'd have to think about you know money even though it's it's like simple and you you automatically think like oh yeah money for clubs but what you brought up was interesting because it's like I've never thought of it before you know besides you know a position like uh, a treasurer mm-hmm. but I mean yeah that is very important about a club and also engaging in those passions would you say that um there are like clubs outside of school or any extracurriculars that could, you know, boost that passion? Yeah, that's the, uh, I think the the gap in the system right now is is community-based clubs or projects that 
aren't affiliated with a particular school. I can't really think of one outside of maybe um, battle bots or competitive robotics type of uh, activities, but that is definitely something that needs to be expanded or at least integrated more. It is providing a, a space for anybody to come and join an activity or, or create a club or some kind of group built around a project or, or, or a challenge. Um, there is a, there are challenges uh, out there with nonprofits, like SME has a digital manufacturing challenge. It's all focused on sustainability. Uh, and it's happening next year, but it is geared towards particular high schools, um, not any one specific, but high school students and college students. So if you're not a high school student or a college student, uh, then how do you participate in those, those activities? Uh, it's definitely a gap in, in the knowledge base for sure. Thank you, Michael, for your answers and your time. And now I'm going to be handing it off to Jaya. Thank you, Grace. Hi, Michael. Uh, on the topic of advice for engineering students, I was actually reading through some of your past interviews. And one of your responses that sparked my interest was that you'd like to see uh, more engineering students do apprenticeship programs. What specific skills do you think these students could obtain in these apprenticeship programs that could help them become a more sufficient engineer? I'm actually, uh, my company has two apprentices now. Uh, one is still in high school. She's in Whitney High School up in Rockland. The other went to Christian Brothers. He graduated back in May and going to Sac City College. As I understand, I'm the only company that's going to have a registered uh, apprenticeship program for manufacturing engineers, for engineers at all in California. So I'm definitely proud of that. Uh, but the skill sets that they're going to learn, and this came from a machinist buddy of mine, so the best engineers are the ones who were machinists, who were welders, who were quality technicians. The ones that have that applied knowledge, not just understand the theory and the uh, math uh, behind um, the science, the math and science behind this, the particular process, but understanding how to apply uh, those skill sets in real time. So the, the real key skill is critical thinking. Uh, that I'm training and teaching people how to do. I purposely throw people on the deep end, not knowing that we've got a little uh, life vest for them, uh, so to speak. Uh, but I want to I want to really push uh, their abilities, even for what they think they can do. And then we troubleshoot the solution together. Um, so kind of like a, a, I provide a safe space of creating mistakes, purposely with them not knowing that uh, that they're that I'm there as a buoy to help them just to get them comfortable with being in an environment where there are, there are no clear and easy solutions, but you got to figure out how to put the pieces together and and know how to go ask people, the right person, the right questions, and go read the, the right uh, information in the right textbooks. Um, so the, the key skill uh, that I'm focused on is, is critical thinking. Uh, as, a, as a core skill. Everything else can be taught. Everything else, can, if somebody wants to learn the material, I've been teaching for, for years. If somebody wants to learn material, anybody on this call wants to learn something, you, I can teach you or somebody can teach you. Uh, but what I can't teach uh, or force is, is passion or, or interest. And ultimately teaching critical thinking, it can be done. But again, it starts with that, that confidence in oneself. And that's where, that's why I focus on. Critical thinking, I definitely think is very important. So I'm, I really like hearing about that. You think everything else could be taught except like that core skill. But back to what you were mentioning to Grace about you think there's a gap between community-based organizations, like not many um, future engineer students taking or implementing those opportunities. What would you suggest or what, what, types of clubs and community-based organizations should these students in the en students interested in engineering field, what should they be doing? That's a good question. Uh, there aren't many resources, uh, unfortunately, nowadays after the, the maker space movement uh, is definitely going through a, an awakening, unfortunately. But there are still community learning centers like the Community Shop Class. That's a nonprofit that started a couple of years ago there in South Tech. I highly recommend you check them out. I, I joined their board recently because I'm, I'm share their passion in, in um, providing training and exposure to different hands-on experiential learning projects to the community. So they are the only neighborhood learning center 
that is focused on that skill development for, for trades based pathways, but you got to have the space to work on cool projects and community shop class provides that space. Symbio is going to start providing that space uh, sometime next year. And we're looking at how we can expand that model again, not a makerspace model because it needs, it's too open-ended, but to your question, having project-based outlets that people can jump onto and participate in um, because they're passionate on learning a new skill that can lead into a career ultimately. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, there aren't many uh, solutions and options at the moment outside of community shop class and and maybe up in Yuba City, there's a nonprofit called a Wide Awake Geek. Um, so that's another outlet as well. Like the the thing you just mentioned, the uh... I think you said the maker revolution. Is that what you said? Yeah, the maker space mm -hmm. is going through an awakening. Yeah, the whole model. Are there any other changes that you foresee in the engineering industry future that you think students interested in this field should be aware or prepared for and how they should navigate that? Oh, yeah. Traditional engineers, you're doing 75% paperwork, meetings, and reports. There's no way around that. Um, so if you want to be an engineer that's working on applied uh, products or activities, then you got to look at small, small businesses. Uh, you're naturally going to wear uh, multiple hats in a small business. So even though uh, like my company guided wave that I worked for, for seven years, they put me in charge of designing a, a whole analyzer from scratch at 23 years old, creating their flagship product that they're going to sell and still sell to this day. And they put me in charge of designing that leading the manufacturing process. And then at the same time, I'm still doing paperwork on um, changes that need to be made or evaluating uh, what's called uh, design standards for the product. So a lot of reading, a lot of analysis uh, in that regard and report writing. But but because I'm with that small business, I get that opportunity and exposure to, to brush up my skills, technical skills that I want to maintain. Uh, but yeah, so for me, I mean, my personal goal is to change the paradigm of engineering uh, and ultimately trades or manufacturing trades-based occupations and using apprenticeship training model where on the job training is done by the employer and then the classroom training is done by the educators, but doing it in parallel instead of sequential. So instead of going through a four-year program and then going into industry, getting a reality check that uh, unfortunately that value of the degree isn't as valuable as it used to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, now the, the emphasis is on applied knowledge. What do you know? Not just what credentials you have uh, is, is the question at hand. Um, and so, it's, I mean, I don't expect the system to change, to be honest, uh, but it's more about providing alternatives to youth uh, that uh, a commitment can be made to be an engineer uh, without, while also accruing uh, tangible experience in the workforce. I was not aware really of any of these changes. So it's really enlightening to hear about the maker's revolution and how this industry is going to evolve in the future, which leads me to my uh, last section of questions before we transfer to Q&A. In the like, age of new technology and changes, like we talked about the maker's revolution, how do you expect things like artificial intelligence to intersect with your company and the engineering industry? It's already here. Uh, AI has been integrated into operational efficiencies for a long time. Uh, the difference is it has that name, AI. But as far as advanced uh, computing software to optimize uh, operational efficiency and um, programming machines and even design work, those concepts have been integrated to manufacturing in particular uh, for years now and been tested out and proven out to be successful. But the challenge is to get uh, what's called legacy. So older folks and in the industry to even understand the value that it can bring, even if they understand the value uh, to get adoption going is, is a, it takes systems and culture change. And some companies they're not going to do that until they have new ownership, to be honest. Others that recognize that shift will look at uh, being proactive and upskilling their existing staff like, like I do. I'm making sure that my, my team is comfortable with software. I've got staff that never really use a computer. And now I've got them doing design work uh, in, in computer-aided design software. And that's the prelude to 
taken them where I want to take them, which is to, to leverage software at every level of our company and, and not being afraid of it, but embracing it as a means to increase efficiency and reduce uh, cost ultimately for all of us. But yeah, we're all about, uh, I mean, software is the future. I've always said that and maintained that. And even as a mechanical engineer, we did a little software in our program, but uh, I'm, I'm personally myself are going to do some some programming and, and get into that as well. Okay, that was our final question. Thank you so much, Michael, for your time. And now moving on to Q&A. We didn't leave much time for that, but yeah, I'll happy to answer any questions. And with that, we open the room for Q&A questions for uh, the rest of our cohort. If anyone is interested in asking a question right now, so please go ahead and uh, say it. Then. I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for Michael, um, so for you, um, I've kind of been into computer engineering and that kind of points our surface since I was in like middle school. Um, is there a way that I can contact you if I have any questions? Would you be able to to do that for some of the students here today? Yeah, uh, I assume Victor would provide uh, my information, but my email, I'm happy to put in the chat. Uh, or it looks like there's no chat that I can see. Oh, there, that's it. Never mind. Yeah, so feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm always, the uh, door is always open. We're in Rancho Cordova. If you want to stop and check out the space, you're more than welcome to do that. I'm part of SME and we host tours at, at companies as well. So expanding uh, the the base of our membership, uh, really just mixers, meetups, and tours are, are the bread and butter of SME. And, um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to hit me up. And yeah, always look in the chat and punch you on the right direction. Or the direction I think is the right, but your journey is your journey. And you get what you need from me and, and make the best decision for yourself. Thank you, Michael. And will anybody else uh, be able to come up with this time and ask for another question for Michael? I had a question for Michael. So you mentioned that you enjoy creating, coming with ideas and creating. I was wondering where you get your ideas or inspiration from and what advice do you have for aspiring engineers that have a mental roadblock and how to work around it? Start with uh, an issue that you have or you need to, or a need that needs to be filled with your personal life. Like I had a, a, a sliding door uh, latch that broke off in my house. I needed to design a new latch and 3D print that and then machine it uh, ultimately. So just starting with something small but again, I'm, I'm simplifying the process, but you definitely need to start with knowing how to use basic hand tools, measuring tools, and understanding how to use software that's free and available. So you're all in high school, I think, right? And so um, uh, Fusion 360 is free to anybody who's uh, still an, a student. And that's a software that has a lot of capabilities um, and it's you know, industry standard and industry based. So starting with what you know, starting small, reverse engineering, I'm looking around like little boxes, little pins, little shapes, just recognizing how to translate physical product into the digital world. Once you've got that mastered, then going backwards, coming up with ideas from scratch, you know how to how to create the features and the shapes in the software to then go back to a 3D printer or a machine to create the product from your mind. That in Legos, I, I've always... Uh, uh, been a fan of, of tearing apart all the Legos uh, in, in my little pile. And then my, my, I have four, three siblings or four of us total. We're all one year apart. My mom was busy. Um, and so we have, uh, I was always a storekeeper. I would build all these little vehicles and the shapes and my, my siblings would play with that, break it and I'd fix it up. Um, so just using things like that, that's a great way to just uh, hone in your creativity and your imagination. But answer, Michael, will anybody else have an additional question that you would like to ask Michael at this time before I finish? Looks like Rosa had a question. Yeah, I had a question. So recently you talked about um, AI and how it's already adopted into the industry of engineering. Do you think like in the future there'll ever be a point where um, there will be cons with having AI in the engineering industry? There will be a what? Um, like cons in the engineering oh. industry, like, like having AI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a term I'm going to use now. It's called bobos. They're essentially a person that is just absent-minded and not really thinking about what they're doing. Right now, there are, if, you, if you're familiar with civil engineers or mechanical engineers, they have to be, to be a professional engineer. You've got to take a license and a test. You got to get a license by taking a test. You don't even need a degree for that. You just got to have the experience and skills and, and get that that test taken and and all that um 
there is a test for computer science or software engineering on the books, but it's not industry practice to require that. I think with AI, the advent of AI creating uh, realms or frameworks for machine learning, you know, it's driven and defined by people ultimately. So how that definition comes about, uh, there needs to be some kind of uh, standard that's set. So I think that's going to be on the horizon um, in, in your career real soon, I think, the next 10 years, that AI will, will to create AI systems and, and software will require, uh, for those that want to do it, uh, for automate, autonomous vehicles in particular, or any kind of system where people could get hurt, right? That's already happening now. People are dying from software that was created for these autonomous systems. Um, so if, if people die, and there's going to be a reaction uh, to society. And, and part of that is going to be to start enforcing um, professional engineering licenses for software engineers. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. So the con, the con is, is uh, right now, a lack of that requirement for developing software. I see that on the horizon. Thank you, Rosa, for asking that question. I will... We have room for one more question before we finish the conversation today. Will anybody else would like to ask another question to Michael? Jay has got her hand raised, or it looks like Hector. Yeah. Right. Yes, uh, I have one question, just more like a fun one. Uh, you talked about Legos. Did that ever like inspire you to get into engineering, or or is this like a hobby or something? It just is it just whatever. It inspired me before I even knew what engineering was. Like I was doing engineering, I was doing that process and I didn't have that mentor or somebody to, to really tie the, to bridge the gap to what engineering was and the activities that I was doing was, was in line with that. So it just happened organically, but yes, that was an exposure for sure. Again, creativity, thinking critically, those are the hallmarks of what a good engineer is. So the more you do that, uh, better off you'll be. Thank you. It was really awesome to hear you talk. It was actually very interesting. And so thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of questions I have, but I think one I think that was really interesting in one article read, what do you see as like the benefits of doing a non-traditional engineering pathway? So I'm all about interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, my focus is actually in systems engineering right now. Um, and systems engineering can be applied to anything. Everything's a system, household, a marriage, a business, government, our, our biological bodies. Right? Everything can be broken down into a system. So taking learning about system engineering in particular uh, can be applied to any and every discipline. Anybody on this call can, can leverage that skill set. So I, I do see non-traditional, again, like I said, critical thinking, creativity, imagine how that can be applied to any engineering discipline and, and non-traditional engineering applications. For me, it's fascinating. So for me, it, workforce development and labor development, the idea of programming people as we're doing with, with uh, machines and software, it, it's, it requires a complex solution in, in multiple organizations. But ultimately, it's a system solution that has multiple inputs, multiple outputs, and boundaries that need to be defined. Thank you so much, Michael, for answering all my questions. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, Michael, we definitely want uh, we will be uh, closing our conversation with you today. Thank you so much for allowing us some of your valuable time and answering the questions of our cohort. So uh, we wish you the best of luck with CBO, and we look uh, forward to hear more from you in the near future. Thank you so much.